five o'clock, Susan Lawrence came out of prison and Mrs. Key rushed forward and presented her with a bouquet of flowers. While they were exchanging greetings, Minnie Lansbury walked out, calling out, hooray, as she moved towards the group that had come to collect her. Hooray, she called again, this time to a group of workers who were carrying out repairs to the prison. Minnie was also given flowers, as was Julia Skur, who came out soon afterwards. Janie McKay was already out on parole following the death of her father and would now not have to return to prison that evening as previously ordered. Minnie explained that the half hour delay had been because they had been waiting for their money. The four cross London authorities were, of course, still waiting for theirs. The three women councillors had a lot of luggage to be brought in from their cells. So the prison authorities allowed the mayor's motor car into the courtyard where suitcases, and books were loaded onto its roof and the women jumped in. Then came Minnie's third, hooray, as she asked whether they would go straight to Brixton and was answered that they would. A photograph shows Minnie and Julia leaning out of the car's windows, both holding their bouquets and smiling. Although the newsprint image is not very sharp, it looks to me that Minnie had lost weight in prison and appeared pale and tired. On their arrival at Brixton, Thompson again handed over the release order and Minnie and her companions heard the sound of cheering and the singing of the red flag from inside the prison building. At around 10 past six, the 25 men councillors stepped through the gates of Brixton prison to freedom. Minnie and Julia greeted their husbands and their comrades and joined in the singing and cheering. A great team photograph captured the councillors, their lawyer and other helpers posed outside the prison wall. Harry Thompson and Edgar Lansbury appear to be the only two men without moustaches. Cars drove the councillors back to Poplar and when they reached the borough boundary at around seven o'clock, a procession of thousands welcomed them home. A brass band headed a throng of Poplar people carrying red flags and Sinn Féin banners, indicating both su the support of the local Irish community and the drawing of links between the respective struggles. The cars took them to the March's house, from where the Irish band led each of them home in turn. Pipes, drums, music, cheering and celebration filled the poverty-stricken borough of Poplar, knowing that it had won a significant victory in its fight against distress. Minnie Lansbury was back home at Wellington Cottage with her husband, Edgar. Oh, that was lovely, thank you. That was, of course, from uh, your biography of Minnie Lansbury, Suffragette Socialist Rebel Councillor, published by Five Leaves. Yes, we, like, we like that book. Yes, I've read yeah. it many times. Cool. <laughs> what, just um, as a matter of interest, what inspired you to write about Minnie Lansbury? Uh, it's actually a follow-up to the first book I ever wrote, um, which was published in 2009 by Merlin Press, called Guilty and Proud of It, which is the story of the Poplar Council Rates Rebellion. Um, about which I will be talking a lot over the next year and a bit because next year is the centenary of when 30 Labour councillors in Poplar in East London um, went to prison rather than increase rates or cut services for local working class people. And when I wrote, when I wrote the story of the Poplar Council Rates Rebellion, um, it's almost like you're living with those 30 councillors for the period of time that it was right, the book was about three years. And uh, I fell in love with Millie, Minnie Lansbury out of all the ones who were living in my house. I thought she was just brilliant. Um, and she was the youngest counsellor. Her story is in a way one of the most tragic because she died shortly after being released from prison at the age of 32. Um, but she also, I think you never write a biography, unless it's about someone like really, 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 really famous, right? A biography is never about a person, just about the person. It's about the movements they're part of, mm -hmm the times they live in and that kind of thing. And Minnie Lansbury represented a unique intersection of really important communities in a movement. So she's in the East End of London at a time where there's a very active labour movement there. She's in the working class suffragette movement. Um, she's the daughter of Jewish immigrants. She's a school teacher, a trade unionist, a Labour Party member and a Communist Party member. Mm. So if you want to learn anything about the living conditions of working class people, including working class Jews in East London around that time, the struggles of uh, feminists for the vote, um, the, the kind of uh, actions at that time of socialists and local government, all that kind of stuff, then, you know, imagine a big Venn diagram of all those movements, the overlapping bit in the middle, that's Minnie Lansbury. Yeah. 
And I, I, also thought, I also thought that a lot of those things are echoed today. Yeah, very definitely. That's I thought that as I was reading you know, it. Labour still has a problem with its uh, relationship with the Jewish community and with its relationship with women in some ways, but it also still has, you know, great role models who've been kind of buried by history, who can show that the, the enormously good contribution that uh, women and Jewish socialists can make to the Labour movement. Mm. Yeah, that's very... And migrants, of course, his daughter of immigrants. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you've you've written quite a variety of stuff. You've published a book on autism in the workplace. Um, you've written poetry. Well, and that's yeah. kind of how you started, really, as a as a poet. Is that right? Yeah, well, I, I, I was thinking about this. If you if if we really go back in time, I started at the age of nine, um, making a little photocopied magazine in my living room called Wildlife Endangered. Oh, um, brilliant. Yeah, so I was way ahead of my time in terms of environmental awareness and stuff. So, yeah, a little magazine I made myself and got a couple of schoolmates to contribute bits to about species that were in danger and, and, and that kind of stuff. And, oh, I must have sold about 30 copies at school and at Brownies. That is um, actually pretty good going. Yeah. But for me, I think being a writer, um, I, I'm only really just accepted that I am a writer, actually. <laughs> And mm. I, think, I think partly that's because it's, it's not my proper job. My proper job is I'm a night tube station supervisor on London Underground. Um, but partly it's because to me, the writing is kind of secondary to what I'm writing about, as it yeah. were. So to me, what I, I, I feel more like I'm an activist who writes mm. rather than that I'm a writer. So the medium I'm, I've chosen to, to write in during my life has changed repeatedly um uh, so yeah endangered wildlife when i was nine and then uh when punk rock and punk poetry ranting poetry came along i joined in that movement and and also wrote a fanzine um as well at the time called blaze in the 1980s and i stopped writing poetry at the end of at the end of the 1980s and didn't think about watch read listen to or write a poem for 25 years mm. and, and then i started again six years ago but it wasn't i wasn't writing or communicating in the meantime i was just doing things other than poetry mm. mainly i'd kind of discover political activism so i was writing articles writing leaflets writing manifestos writing and doing speeches and that kind of thing so forms changed over the years i think mm. um, so it's more about communication than the actual craft yeah. of writing yeah and and different things inspire me so you know people say what do you write books about and and you're right it's uh Particularly since I, I mean, I didn't write my first book till I was in my 40s, which was guilty and proud of it. And since then, I wrote um, one called Plundering London Underground, which was about the disastrous public private partnership policy on London Underground under the new Labour government. And then Autism Equality in the Workplace. Um, and then the book of Minnie Lansbury. And most recently, a book called uh, The Big J versus the Big C, which is. Um, mm. The diary, the diary of my cancer treatment, uh, with yeah. some poems thrown in. So it's very eclectic. But then um, I don't know whether it's my autistic brain wiring or what. But I just can't can't stick to one subject. Yeah, I guess uh, you write about what you're interested in at the time. Yeah. Uh, but if you're not interested in it, then there's absolutely no point at all, is there? Yeah, indeed. Um, so what are you writing at the moment? Uh, lots of poetry. All right. So, Lots of poetry inspired by COVID, lots of poetry uh, inspired by Black Lives Matter, mm. and uh, various random bits of poetry, some poetry inspired by my recent moving house after 30 years after I first moved to Hackney in East London. Um, I've now moved out to Lewis in the South Downs and um, written a bit about that. Yeah, but mostly poetry. I've kind of, I don't have a book project at the moment. I'm kind of putting it in. It's kind of on hold. Yeah. So my life settles down a bit, I think. Mm. Yeah, because you have to... I, I have an it. ambition in future to write a book called The History of Normal, which okay. is like a history of the concept of normality, because the concept of like social pressure to conformity is so oppressive mm. that people it leaves out and squeezes out, etc. And I think it's... Uh, I think it could be really interesting to unpick... Um, 
where normal comes from because often we look at issues like a snapshot of where they are now um, but one of the I think one of the big things we can take from Marx is that now study the history of stuff if you really want to understand something study its history mm. study how how it got to where we are now then you're going to be able to better understand um, where it is now yeah and I'd kind of like to write so I've written quite a lot of articles on Marxism and autism and I've recently uh, set up a discussion group on it as well. I'm hoping at some point to compile those together in a book. Um, and I, de I deny all rumours that the reason for this is that so I can use the strap line, there is a spectrum haunting Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I think it's worth it just for that, to be honest. I think it is too, yeah. <laughs> Certainly, uh, when you write it, bring the manuscript to five leaves. It'd be very interesting. Yeah. In that. Smash the neurocracy, I think, is going to be, could possibly be. Oh, the, nice. The title. Me, and my son, me and my son, who's also autistic, came up with this, accidentally came up with this term, neurocracy. It was actually a mistype from, from typing bureaucracy. Um, and we realised it was actually quite a good term to discuss, to describe the way that, you know, systems, ruling class, politics or whatever is functions around an assumption of neurotypicality and mm. therefore uh, excludes people who are neurologically atypical. Yeah, I mean the whole sort of concept of normality is is kind of fatally flawed in that yeah there there are groups that are minority groups but when you add them together I guess the majority mm. of people Absolutely. are in one minority or another. But there, I mean there are also people who are odd and abnormal and what have you in all sorts of different ways so Minnie Lansbury, for instance, you know, a Jewish woman marrying a non-Jewish man in 1914. Mm. Um, a woman who was, uh, uh, you know, as modern, as politically active as her. Obviously, the suffragettes facilitated that to happen. Um, but in a lot of ways, I think Minnie Lansbury would have been considered a bit odd at the yeah. time. But in a really, really good way. A really, mm. really good way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think you have to be odd in some way to make any changes to the system, don't yeah, you? Yeah, nor normal's it? overrated. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, there's a, a sort of few questions about COVID that I was going to ask. Yeah. Um, you say you've been writing a lot more poetry. Why, um, why do you think poetry is the way you've chosen to... Well, do you know what... Um... <laughs> The, the flippant answer, although I think it's true, is like every time there's a disaster, everyone writes poems, don't they? Like everyone turns to poetry in times of disaster. Uh, not always very good poetry, I have to say. But it's there's something about poetry which I think allows people to express and uh, kind of navigate their emotions in a way that maybe other things wouldn't. Mm. It's like you've got permission to express how you feel in a poem. Um, so as soon as lockdown started, Realising that that was going to happen, um, I set up a Facebook group called Corona Versus, Poems from the Pandemic, and I, you know, invited all my poetry mates, mm. and I thought, I thought maybe 50 people or something could join. There's nearly a thousand in it now, and it, it, it got up that quick really soon. And just loads, and people were just posting loads of really, really good poetry. So it soon became obvious that we'd be able to do an anthology. Yeah. So here is said anthology. This is actually an anthology of over 60 poems written entirely in the first week of lockdown. Crikey. So it's a real kind of time capsule type snapshot of how mm. we we're all feeling at the time. And some of them are funny and some of them are tragic. And, uh, you know, some of them are formal styles. Some of them are kind of free verse. Some of them are rant. Some of them are... It, and, and they cover the different aspects, you know. They're, they're, mm. they're not all about toilet roll hoarding, but some of them are. <laughs> um, some of them are about nudge theory. Some of them about some of them about death, you know. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so should anyone wish to buy this, please do. It's only eight pounds for the print book and three ninety nine for the um, for the uh, ebook. That's what you call it, isn't it? An ebook, and you can buy both from janinebooth.com slash shop. And all the proceeds go to We Shall Overcome, which is a uh, kind of anti-austerity community musicians and poets thing. Oh, we do gigs know, to raise money for stuff. And, uh, and, and our slogan is a raised fist and a helping hand. Yes. Yes, I've come across that group. It's an excellent group. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's got, in fact, it's got a branch in Nottingham, hasn't it? It has. Yeah. Yeah. Pete Yendall runs, I think. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so it sounds like it's made you more productive, possibly. It has, yeah. So I, I, I've got two poems in that anthology. One is the one I'm going to perform later on, um, called Wherefore Art Thou Capitalism? And the other one is called Stay the Fuck Home. <laughs> possibly a little bit too sweary. Um, but yeah, but then I ended up writing dozens and dozens and dozens of them. So, yeah. Uh, there's, uh, there's, there's a couple going to pop up in other anthologies. So, one I wrote called Hancock's Half Hour um, about the daily briefings with Matt <laughs> Hancock. That's going to appear in one. But yeah, yeah. Lots of stuff on that and lots of stuff on Black Lives Matter. Um, and partly that's, it's not a new issue for me as a poet because I've written poetry before about previous incidents of police brutality. Um, for instance, the killing of Tamia Rice. Yeah. And, the, uh, and one called Officer Slager's Defence um, about the copper who killed the guy with the, the broken rear tail light. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good way of communicating somehow, isn't it? You can encapsulate the whole kind of essence of something in a poem mm -mm, mm -mm. and really get the whole thing across yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and evoke the emotions that go with it as well yeah, yeah definitely um so have you discovered any surprising inspirations from the whole uh, of lockdown black lives matter you know everything that's been going on this year uh, i'm not sure i can think of anything that would Surprising. I think I probably I, I I have a general approach to life of expecting the unexpected. So mm. um, I, I don't think much surprises me at all. Um, I've been, I suppose I could say, pleasantly surprised. Certainly pleased by the adaptability of performance poetry to go online. Mm. Um, so I've done quite a lot of gigs online, uh, slotted in performance with other people. Some I've done myself. Um, so I'll just, um, I'm, I'm doing one a week on Sunday. It says a week on Sunday from the day in which we're talking, obviously, not the day in which we're broadcasting, who knows. Uh, but on the 27th of February called Cops and COVID, Janine versus Cops and COVID, which is an hour of my poetry about, uh, you know, police and the pandemic and maybe some polemic. Um, yeah, don't know, surprising, not really. Nothing surprises me. Yeah, I guess that's understandable. One thing was, I suppose one thing I could call a pleasant surprise is um, in putting together the anthology, available from my workshop, um, there's some well-established, lifelong published professional poets in there. And there's also co some complete newbies yeah. who never had any idea there was going to be published, who just posted something on that Facebook group and had no idea how good it was. Mm. And then when uh, me and Attila the stockbroker, who helped me with the selection process, when we sifted through about 500 poems and picked out the 60 we liked, you know, we, the most, we, we found that, you know, some of the people had never been published before, had never even written a poem before. And those people think of themselves as poets now, first time ever. Yeah, that's I'm really pleased with that. that. I really like that. Love it when that happens. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you have been engaging with the writing community a lot is it more so yeah. since lockdown do you think? i have to say the main the main i've always tried to engage with other writers i never see this as a kind of solo thing at all and um one of the things i try to i've always tried to do is um like there's a reason why i don't do this writing thing full time um and it's because i i, I don't want to exist just within a writing bubble Mm. Um, I can assure you, for example, that being a night chief station supervisor gives me an endless supply of material um, <laughs> for books, articles and poetry. Um, but I, so I want to be the activist who writes. I want to be the worker who writes, um, mm. et cetera, uh, to get that kind of material. And so I will always try to work with other writers, but I'll also work closely with, say, trade unionists. Um, and so I'll often do poetry gigs. Uh, a trade union event. So, like a couple of weeks ago, I did a turn at the um, annual uh, celebration of the 1911 Lanethley strike, um, which has been running as a trade union event for years. And uh, now I bring poetry to it. And I like that because I like, you know, a lot of working class activists um, 
a, a lot of them really do like poetry. A lot of them are kind, were kind of put off by poetry at school and have never mm. touched poetry since. And they think it's some kind of dry, esoteric, academic thing that's nothing to do with them. Um, so when you can bring them into contact with poetry that is about their lives and their struggles, um, then they respond really well. So I like to yeah. bring poetry to politics and politics to poetry. So engaging with the writing community, but also engaging with other communities of struggle and, mm -hmm. and bringing them together. Yeah. So last, last Friday, I was standing on a wall outside the home office um, doing a poem and then a speech and then another poem. Uh, a demonstration against uh, the deportation of a young man called Osim Brown, who's a black autistic fellow who is in prison um, for a crime he didn't commit because he was convicted under a joint enterprise conviction. So mm -hmm. he was convicted of, uh, of nicking a mobile phone because he was with the people who nicked a mobile phone, even though he didn't do it himself. And uh, because he moved to Britain at the age of four from Jamaica and never got his nationality regularised, um, as soon as he's released, he's going to be deported to Jamaica. Despite the fact that he's quite si significantly mentally ill, mm -hmm. autistic, physically ill, knows nobody in Jamaica. In terms of everything other than these documents, he's British, his family are here. Um, it's an absolute disaster. And, um, you know, I would be part of a campaign like that anyway. If I can mobilise my poetry to support that, then so much the better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I like that. Um, rather than writing just for the sake of writing, writing to draw attention to issues and make people yeah, yeah. understand issues is yeah, so absolutely. important. Yeah. Um, so who inspires you? Not necessarily writers. Who, who... People in struggle. People fighting against oppression. Mm. Um, you know, people making demands. People who change the world for the better. Um, and when I say pe people in struggle, I mean kind of big political struggles, but actually people who struggle through their daily lives as well. Mm. Um, life, life can be a struggle. And um, I want to amplify the voices of people who are struggling um, because that inspires me. In fact, I've got a half written poem called Amplify about, to, about the sort of people I want to amplify. Yeah. That's a really good use of writing because, so, uh, you know, there are so many people that don't have voices yeah. or do have voices, but aren't listened to. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and sometimes even the left um, or people who like to think of themselves as progressive miss out on amplifying the people they need to amplify. So for instance, um, religious or ethnic minority communities in Britain, uh, obviously are subjected to discrimination and oppression, but we need to amplify the voices, not just of their leaders, who are often self-appointed leaders. Yeah. We also need to amplify the voice of the youth, of the women, um, of the more, more radical sects and radical politically rather than radical religiously, I must say. Yeah. Um, but do you know what I mean? Sometimes yeah. there's a tendency for people who are progressive to kind of pick out uh, a leader to amplify, and often that leader won't very accurately often that leader will be more conservative than the people they purport to lead yeah and often there's a, a huge variety i mean i guess in any sort of situation where you've got a leader representing a group of people the the group of people is going to be so diverse that mm -hmm. you can't represent everyone's voice through yeah, yeah. one voice so amplifying yeah, yeah. the smaller voices and the more um, divergent voices is really important. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a socialist and I'm very active in the trade union movement and in the Labour Party as well. And um, I, I think we have a problem over our culture of leadership. I think people want to want to worship a leader mm. and want a leader to lead them out of oppression. The problem is, though, um, as as some famous old Marxist trade union, pro, unionist, probably Eugene Debs said, it if one person can lead you out of oppression, then another person can lead you back into it. So what a really good leader does is they make everyone leaders. Yeah. They, what they do is they lead the movement they lead to understand that it can make change itself. 
that's just reminded me of the best television series ever, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, <laughs> where in the very last in the very last season of Buffy, there's all these potential new slayers, and she's supposed to pick one of them. And in the end, she says, "No, we're going to break the rules. You can all be slayers. Everyone, all all girls yeah. around the world can all be slayers. Yeah, rise up together and, and destroy the vampires." Yeah. I, yeah, I never really thought of the political undertones of that, and the feminist undertones. I like that. That's good. Yeah. Um, what are you most proud of in your writing career? Oh, do you know, I, don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't know, but because it's you asking, I'm going to say uh, rescuing Minnie Lansbury from historical obscurity. Uh, that is certainly something to be proud of because she is yeah. totally inspirational. Yeah, and like so many women just get forgotten by history, mm. overshadowed by more famous men in their own families. Yes. Um, or just, you know, who had even heard of Millie Lansbury? Except people who walked down by road and looked up and said, Millie Lansbury Memorial Clock, who's she then? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what do you hope to achieve in the future? Uh, world revolution. Excellent. With, accompanied by poetry. <laughs> <laughs> but you yeah, won't lead it. You'll make everyone lead it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, 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 I know I'm repetitively banging a drum here, but I'm an activist who writes. So mm. for me, it's about it's about changing the world. You know, and if I, if I can help do that I, th I think to change the world we have to understand what it is now and i think writing and reading is part of developing that knowledge mm. developing theory understanding history so i'm trying to make my kind of small contribution um to that and i think on the performance side of my writing that can you know if that can make a contribution to building a movement then then great mm. yeah and it all comes, I mean, I, was, I, I keep banging on about it, but it all comes down to communication in the end, doesn't it? Yeah. Communicate to people, between people, on behalf of people, and writing and particularly performance does that really well, I think. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a very useful tool. Okay, um, have you got a poem that you'd like to read us out with? Okay, so I, 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 I'm going to leave you out with, with one of my two poems from this, not the really sweary one called Stay the Fuck Home, um, but another one um, called Wherefore Art Thou Capitalism? Because it, it struck me quite early on in the lockdown that uh, the kind of ideological heralds of capitalism had gone kind of quiet. Um, like, you know, the people who, th who thought that state intervention <laughs> is a really bad thing suddenly wanted some state intervention. Um, so I wrote this poem and it is called, it's called Wherefore Art Thou Capitalism? No one's saying leave it to the market. No one's claiming competition's key. That stockbrokers will lead us from the darkness. No one's sneering now at stuff for free. No one says that laissez-faire will sort it. No one claims that we'll be saved by greed. No one says just those who can afford it should get the test or get the care they need. No one says we need more speculators. No one's calling care workers unskilled. No one waits for private ventilators. No one thinks compassion should be built. No one says the rich should keep their fortunes instead of sharing wealth for common good. No one says they wouldn't pool resources to help the sick and frightened if they could. No one says it's fine to charge your damnedest. Supply will match demand and fix the prices. No one says that mutual aid is madness. No one trusts a banker in a crisis. So where are Adam Smith and Milton Friedman? Where's triumphant capitalism hiding? Where's the wealth of nations when you need them? Tell the stock exchanges when you find them. But keep your guard for when this crisis passes and profit praisers raise their voice anew. When corporate beggars claim their place as masters, remember solidarity got us through. Tell them that we won't come back to serve them. Tell them profit damages our health. We'll share the riches for we all deserve them and build 
a democratic commonwealth. Thank you.